So the first thing I want to start off with is the differences between day game and night game, right? Because in order to understand anything, we have to define it first. So what is day game? Um, to me, day game is anything outside of a bar or club. Why? Because bars and clubs just change the, the specifics of an approach a little bit. Why? Because there's drugs and alcohol, right? Outside of that, um, anything besides that really falls into this model more than anything else. So there's advantages and disadvantages to daytime. One of the biggest advantages is that it's not a competitive environment during the day, right? One of the most annoying things about going out and doing night game is that you have the music, the lights, you know, other girls, her friends, right, other guys. Um, you know, there's a million different things to do. It's like a stimulation fest, especially nightclubs, right? There's just, it's really hard to be the most interesting thing. During the day, there's not a whole lot of competition. She's walking around doing her errands, she's doing her grocery shopping, she's at a bookstore. There's not too, too much going on that's really going to um, get in the way of your conversation. Um, one of the big advantages, right, so how many people here are, are familiar with the idea of group theory? Like the idea that you're supposed to approach women in groups? Just a quick show of hands. OK, cool. Group theory doesn't really work during the day. It does in one certain situation, and that's uh, two girls sitting by themselves. But like every now and then, we'll get weirdo students on boot camp. And they'll be like, they'll be like I want to see you game that five set of five guys walking with two girls, and they're holding hands down the street. I'm like. I can do it, but it's not going to work. I mean, if you really want to see me get blown out, that's cool. But I'm not here to tell you that you can pick up any girl or every girl, because that's not what I'm about teaching. Like I said before, my shit comes from real life experience, right? Real life experience means nobody gets every girl they go after. I certainly don't. I've been out with everyone you've read about in the game. None of them do either, right? So the idea behind everything I teach is about how do you find the women that you're attracted to that you have a high degree of compatibility with. Everything that I teach falls into that. You're not going to get every girl. If you think you can get every girl or any girl, door's right back there, peace. Right? OK, so group sets, they just, I did, a, I did a ton of them, you know? And what always happens is they're walking down the street, two or three girls, and you can't have a really high energy level because that's super weird during the day, right? That's another difference between daytime and nighttime stuff. At night, you can be really high energy and expressive and kind of all over the place, and it's accepted because it's in a certain environment. If you're doing that kind of stuff during the day, you're weird, right? I always say day game is like the best test of how normal of a person you are. Like, as much of a self-hating, self-loathing weirdo as I was, at least I was somewhat socially adjusted, right? Like, I don't start talking about killing babies and, you know, eating plants or whatnot. So, Energy levels. Generally, the energy level you use during the day is going to be about a third of what you're using at night. Generally a third, right? Another thing, touching. Touching is a big thing at night. You really need to touch. Why? Because nighttime stuff is going to lead to sexual escalation, one night stands, et cetera, et cetera. We have a seminar on that tomorrow. But during the day, you're not going to do a lot of touching. Why? A couple reasons. First thing, it's not the right environment, right? You're walking down the street and you grab a girl. That's pretty scary, right? That ends with, hey, wanna, does this smell like chloroform and want to come check out my van, right? So don't touch during the day. Now, I'm not going to say don't touch 100%. I will say the touching you do during the day is always going to be something that you wouldn't be uncomfortable doing to your boss. That's a really good general rule for touching during the day. If it would make you uncomfortable to do that to your boss, don't do it to women during the day. Um, other things. The girls are not drunk or high. This is a sad fact about bars or clubs, but it's the truth. People are not drunk. They're not in social mode. That's the biggest difference, right? That's the reason you can't just walk up, walk down the street throwing out opinion openers, because people are not in a social mode. They're walking to get their laundry. They're shopping for a book. They're doing grocery shopping. They're trying to find a gift for their niece, this, that, or the other. They're not thinking about, oh, someone's going to approach me. So it goes outside of their reality. We're going to talk a lot about social mode today, because that's something that you have to find a way around. Because if they're not going to pay attention to you, then they're not going to be able to become attracted to you, and you're not going to be able to set up a date. Day game model doesn't go to sex. My day game model, now, I'll teach you guys when we get to the phone game and um, setting up dates section, I'll teach you guys how you can get girls to have sex with you on the first day that you meet during the day. But there's a whole little glitchy thing to it. This goes to setting up a date. Meet to set it, not getting a phone number, but setting up a date, meaning a specific time and place that you guys are going to meet again. That's a really, really important part of this. 
One other um, main difference between day game and nighttime, legitimate time constraints. All right, everyone's heard of a false time constraint. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But during the day, it's not the same as when people go out to a bar or a club. When people go out to a bar or a club, they've basically decided that for the rest of that night, that's what they're doing. Maybe they'll bounce around to a couple bars or clubs. Maybe they'll meet up with a couple different groups of friends. But they're out to socialize, to drink, to have fun. If a girl's walking across a park because she's coming back from her lunch break, guess what? It doesn't matter if you have the best game in the world. She still has to be back at work at a certain time. Doesn't change that. So there are legitimate time constraints. And because of that, everything is going to shrink down to a much, much slower, much, much smaller time frame, a time frame at which it's somewhat inappropriate to be pushing girls for sex. Right? All right, so before I get started, I want to talk about basics, because I'm a big believer in fundamentals. There's a lot of guys who teach a lot of things that are really, really amazing in the community, things like boyfriend destroyers, things like you know, sexual framing, things like breakthrough comfort. All that stuff is great. But guess what? If you don't have a solid set of fundamentals, none of it works. You can't, you can't, um, you can't neg a girl or say something convinced to get an emotional reaction if you can't make eye contact. Right? You can't tell a story about how your stripper ex-girlfriend needed you to save her if you, can't make, if you can't speak without stuttering and slurring your words. Right? So there's, four, there's five things that you can basically work on all day long which will help you with your game. And I call them the four T's and an L. It actually should be the four T's and a B, but whatever. So the first one, talking to strangers. One of the big reasons that people have approach anxiety is because you have to go from being silent and being in your own head to all of a sudden being talkative, right? It's not so much the fear as the, what am I going to say? I don't feel like I'm in the flow of a conversation. Where is this going to go? Well, how do you fix that? You fix that by talking to people all the time, right? Every day, you're presented with 10 to 12 opportunities to have a 30-second social comfort conversation. You've got people you buy lunch from. You've got people on public transport. You've got people who do your laundry. You've got the grocery checker. You've got people in the park. Stop wearing a watch. Start asking people for the time. Like, start asking for directions to places you already know to get to. The reason is you have to get used to talking to strangers. There's no way around that if you want to do cold approach. Cold approach, first of all, right, is a pretty ridiculous thing. Like, you're walking up to a girl you've never met and trying to start a sexual relationship. That's like one step above walking up to some random dude and trying to get him to loan you money. Like, it's, a pretty, it's the most difficult way to get laid. If you wanted to make a scale of like easiest ways to get laid versus hardest ways to get laid, right? Easiest is go to a hooker, hardest is cold approach. Internet is like a degree below like paying for it, but we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> Anyone can get laid off the internet, even a slug. All right, so talking, talk to strangers, have conversations on a daily basis, become a more talkative social person. It's difficult at first. Look, no one is more antisocial than me. I would love to just stay at home, blaze the weed, play some video games, read some comic books, right? But guess what? That doesn't get you to where you want to be. One of the things about pickup and all of this stuff is that it's self-improvement, right? Like, guess what, guys? You stumbled into a self-help seminar. We don't have a fire walk and you know, a bunch of sleazy, like, clatchy slogans and stuff, but this is self-help. The more you become a cool person, the easier it is to get girls. There's no way around that. And trust me, I've done both ways. I've become the really good manipulator. It's creepy. So talk to people. Second one, touch. Touching is a really big thing. But wait, didn't I just tell you not to touch people? Yes, I did. But there are socially acceptable ways of touching. What's one way? When you meet someone, every time you meet a new person and you're introduced, you guys do a form of touching within 10 seconds. What do you guys think it is? Shake hands, right? Why do we do that? Because touching is one way we make other people comfortable with us. The idea of touching someone makes someone a real person. If I'm just like, oh, yeah, hey, I'm a lot less real to you. If I'm like, hey, man, nice to meet you. Um, they even did studies on this. Infants, if they're removed from touching, they get sick. Some of them can even die. Right? We as human beings need to be touched. So again, you want to balance that out with the idea of not touching girls in a creepy way during the day. Right? So shoulder to elbow area. All right. But get used to touching people. Like, Get used to adding a touch on the arm, emphasizing your points with touching. Um, you know, high-fiving people, like if you ever go to Starbucks, you can do high-fives. There's a lot of safe forms of touching, but a lot of us guys who are bad with women, or we're bad with women, we weren't raised in a kind of a touching environment, you know? Like if you look at a lot of guys who are naturally good with girls, one of the categories of guys who naturally do well with girls is athletes, right? 
Why? Athletes are pretty comfortable with touching. Like, it's really weird and gay to slap your buddy on the ass, but you know, if he just made a three-point shot, all of a sudden it becomes normal. You guys don't have basketball in Australia. It doesn't hit. It's all right. Um, so talking, touching. Third one, teasing. Teasing is one of the best ways to be playful and show that you don't take yourself so seriously. One of the things that really bothers girls is guys who take themselves too seriously, because guess what? It's not fun. If you're meeting someone new, you want it to be fun and exciting. You don't want it to be the same old shit. So teasing. Get used to teasing people on a daily basis. Now, I hesitate to teach this because a lot of guys, they misinterpret teasing as go out and say mean, fucked up shit to girls. <laughs> so. I, I, every, look, I've taught, I've taught 158 boot camps at this point over the last four years. And um, every boot camp, I would get a student who would be like, I came up with this great new line to say to a girl. It's funny. It's teasing. I'm like, OK. And it's, it's like a train wreck's coming, right? You can't look away, but at the same time, you kind of want to. Um, one of them told me that his teasing line was, um, you're a bitch whose pussy smells like tuna fish. Yeah. I can't make this up. Somehow in his head, he thought that that was a teasing line. Teasing is friendly. We're going to get to teasing and banter and all that stuff later. I'll give you some specific examples and some kind of ideas behind it. But for now, just get the idea of teasing people. And again, don't go out of your way to tease people. But if it's something you would tease one of your friends for, you can tease a complete stranger for it. It's OK. And the last one, body language. So body language is one of those things that I think is both overemphasized and underemphasized in the community. The reason I think it's overemphasized is because you'll see some people whose entire method is body language based. First of all, um, a lot of people have read that 93% of communication is nonverbal, right? And a couple people familiar with that statistic. Something like 78% body language, like 14 or 15% tonality, and then facial expressions, and then words. Now, that's not entirely true, and it's a skewed statistic. But the fact of the matter is, the way you hold yourself and your facial expressions tell a lot about you. As humans, because we were you know, evolved, we had to learn different sorts of things. Like One of the things that's a characteristic trait in every human is the ability to recognize mother's faces really quickly. Facial recognition is built into us because if you don't know who your mother is, you're in a lot of trouble as a kid. So there are things that are hardwired. Now, body language to me is not that difficult. First thing with body language is it's about lengthening and straightening. right? A lot of people, they slump forward. A lot of tall guys slump their shoulders because they're sick of the beanpole jokes or whatever they get earlier in their life. Lengthening and straightening. You want to make sure you're tall, straight, erect, pun intended. Um, <laughs> but keep your body completely long and straight. You don't want to be crunched up. There's two types of bad body language. The first type of bad body language is where a guy's obviously trying to not take up any space. right? That's what I call nice guy body language. You want to make sure that the other people are even more comfortable than you are. And so you want to make sure that you're not in any way infringing on their personal space, because you're not a worthy person, and you don't deserve to be comfortable. Then, and generally this is a pendulum effect, right? That's guys before they find self-help in the community. And then they swip to the other side, where they're like spreading out. And they're like, you go out to dinner with them, and they're like at a nice restaurant. And they sit down like this. <laughs> yeah, time to fuck, right? Instead, you want your body language to be normal and comfortable looking. Don't take up too little space. Don't take up too much space. Spatial relevance is a really big thing. A lot of you guys may have heard about opening over the shoulder. There's nothing magical about opening over the shoulder. All it is is it's one example of how to be spatially relevant to another person. As people, we're designed to have a certain comfort zone. right? General ideas of personal space are between 18 and 36 inches. As soon as you enter that proximity of someone, you're going to make them a little uncomfortable. So knowing how to ease into that makes a big, big difference. My big point that I want to make with, facial uh, with body language is facial expressions. And the reason that's a big point is because most guys, if you don't go through acting or theater training, you don't learn to use your face. So you'll see guys out there, and they'll be saying like cocky, funny lines or like funny jokes. And they'll be like, you and I would never get along. <laughs> I wouldn't take your shit, and you wouldn't take my shit. We would fight all the time. That doesn't work. There's nothing magical about the line. It's the delivery behind the line. So something I recommend every, every student of mine ever does is go onto Wikipedia, find a list of the 20 emotions that they have, print it out, stand in front of the fucking mirror, and work on those emotions. Use faces, because here's the thing. 
When I was first coming into this in early 2003, 2004, um, there were a lot of guys out there writing. And one of these guys wrote something that I'll never forget. It was a guy named Commander Zap. Right. And what he said was, <laughs> awesome Power Ranger names, right? So he said, don't say anything with words that you can say with a look. Don't say anything with a look you can say with a wink. Don't say anything with a wink you can say with a smile. The idea is to use the bare minimum amount of communication to get your point across. Body language is that, right? If you have good body language, then guess what? You're taking a whole lot of noise out of whatever message your verbals are delivering, right? If you're telling a girl about how you get all these chicks and you're like, yeah, my um, ex-girlfriend is a model, and it's not going to work. It's not going to work. The noise obscures the signal. So the key with body language, slow everything down, take up space, lengthen, straighten, all right? That's basically it. Look relaxed. Look comfortable in your skin. And then have facial expressions that go with what you're saying. Right? If you're saying something that's funny, you can smile and look like you're saying something funny. There's way too much emphasis put on being dry pan and dry. All right, so let's get into my day game model here. All right, so my model, a little bit different from other people's. Um, this came from kind of my experiments and kind of experiences that happened out in the world. So the first thing that happened, all right, the first thing we're going to talk about was the idea of social comfort. I'll call that SC. Social comfort. Because what a lot of um, methods think, including a method that I used to teach for, right? I was a lead instructor with Mystery Method from 2005 to 2008, um, is that attraction has to come before comfort. That idea is blatantly wrong. You can't be attracted to someone you're not comfortable around. Right? Doesn't matter how hot a girl is, if she's standing down a dark, shady alley of doom, you're thinking twice before you walk down there. Right? If you're not socially comfortable with what's going on, there's no room to grow attraction. And it wasn't until a guy named AFC Adam pointed that out in his model to me that I realized that that's true. You have to have that social comfort first. If you look at all of the kind of strategies for opening, they all first imply the idea of social comfort, getting someone comfortable with talking to you. So in my method, social comfort takes the phase of a social question. And we'll get into those in a little bit. But a social question is something like, hey, do you know where an ATM is around here? Hey, do you know how to cook this? Do you know where such and such a street is? It's something normal that fits into the blueprint of how women have been spoken to before during the day. right? And the reason I came up with this is because when I was going out, I'd be like, hey, I need a quick opinion on something. And I was loud enough, and, I, may, I, like, and I, I, I had good body language and everything, but sometimes it just wouldn't hook. Like, it was like they just couldn't hear it. And I realized one day when I was walking down the street and some like, flyer guy in New York City was trying to talk to me, and I literally couldn't hear him. And I was like, that's what's happening. Is it's, it's, just, it's outside of where my attention is. So until you get, your attention gets snapped out of that in a way that's socially comfortable, right? If he had been like, hey, flyers, free comedy show, but he was doing some sort of weird, it was a weird way he was trying to sell the flyers. Um, and I realized that a lot of the time when your, your attention is not focused on something, things get drowned out. They just turn into like the ether around you. And so I thought, OK, what are some ways that you know, people get talked to during the day? I used to call them tourist questions, but they're just social questions. Now, earlier we talked about um, how you have legitimate time constraints, right? So my model is going to be a little complex because there's going to be a couple things that rely on if ors. But um, the next thing you want to do is you want to quickly get from that social question into a teasing, playful conversation. So we have a tease right there. So for example, if I'm you know, shopping in a grocery store, I see a cute girl. I'll grab something off the aisle. I'll go, hey, do you know how to cook this? She'll go, yes or no, right? I'm a big believer in contingencies and verifiable things, right? You get, you get two or three responses. You go out, right? The big problem, the big reason why a lot of you guys are in this room is because you don't approach enough girls. That's the number one problem with why guys don't get good. So assuming that that's not a problem, it's that you then don't pay attention to the responses you're getting. Every response I ever get from a girl, I take a note of it because it means I did something to create that. You're responsible for communication. In NLP, they have a saying which is that communication the meaning of communication is the response it elicits, right? So even if you're try not trying to elicit that response, if you do something and it elicits a response, guess what? That's because of what you just did. So you look at what's happening, right? So I came up with these social questions. I'd go out, I'd get a yes or a no, right? 
Yes, they'd explain a little bit. No, you know, it kind of just ends. So I was like, okay, there's got to be some way to turn that into something fun and playful. Right? I was like, all right, here's what they do. I can role play and tease right off the opener. Right? I can be like, hey, do you know how to cook this? And she's like, no. I'm like, oh, you're so fired as my personal chef. I'm going to have to call the other girl up. And really, she cooks in much skimpier outfits, so you're already in trouble. Right? Now we're cut to a more sexual level of conversation. It's teasing, it's playful, it's not creepy, but it's outside of the norm. Right? We start in the norm, and then we deviate from it as quickly as possible so we don't get lumped in with any other guy who's ever asked her that. Now, that's going to lead to the second step, which is qualification. Daytime is not about attraction. Because girls don't get approached a lot during the day, your attraction is mostly going to happen from approaching her and having the balls to tease her. That's the attraction switch. I believe that balls are one of the biggest attraction switches we have, right? The courage, the social courage to go up and talk to someone, confidence, call it whatever you want to call it, but it has a major effect. Now, next thing though is you'd attract and attract and attract, right? This was my problem for forever, because I'm hilarious. Um, I would just sit there and be entertaining. And that doesn't lead to anything. Why? Because what is attraction? Who wants to throw out an idea of what attraction is? Someone grab a mic. Who has an idea of what they think attraction is? Lust for someone else. Lust? OK, maybe. Who else has an idea? Come on, guys. You got to get a little, we need a little thinking input here. Interest? OK, maybe. Attraction is a feeling. That's all it is. It's just a feeling. Just like happiness, just like sadness, just like lust, just like all of those things, it's an emotional response. It's the emotional response that goes, dun, 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 dun. I want that, right? That's it. Now, much like all emotions, it's fleeting. It's not permanent. You can go from a, an entire spectrum of emotions in 30 seconds. You know, you imagine at 12.01, someone calls and tells you you won the lottery. 12.02, you find out your dad dies. You're going to spin from one high of emotion to one low, provided you have a good relationship with your dad. Eh. Right. But emotions are quick. They're fleeting. Right? They, they're not actually what gets you the girl. Attraction is pretty much the least useful part of an entire system. Attraction is just the thing that allows you access so that she's willing to see if you're worth actually getting to know. That's it. It's like the key to the box. But you still, wow, that was a really bad unintentional pun. Um, <laughs> But you still have to do all the work. You can have the best attraction game in the world, but if you don't know how to qualify and show girls that you actually like them, all you're going to get is flakes. I know because I used to have a big bag of phone numbers. right? Um, so we don't want to get into attraction, especially not when we have a shortened time frame. The shorter the time frame, the less attraction we want to do because we want to get to the stuff that will actually make her want to see us again. And that's called qualification. And what is qualification? It's simply finding out what she has going for her, right? It's giving her legitimate reasons that you like her and would like to see her again besides her looks, right? It's complimenting. Now, a lot of people have a lot of problems with this, right? Because what happens is you have the pussy asshole spectrum too, right? We talked about the body language spectrum. Well, we also have the pussy asshole spectrum. So we get into this, and we've all had some horror stories. Look, I, my first girlfriend. The thing that drove me into the community, which I didn't tell you guys in my intro, my first girlfriend was a virgin when I was 18 or 17. And um, I really wanted to respect that. And I loved her so much, right? And then we took a two week break, and she fucked two guys, and then I took her back, right? So no matter how bad you've been with women, I've been worse, trust me. So we come into this, and we've had like, a lot of bad experiences with women. We, we're kind of a little angry towards women, some of us. you know, um, And we feel like you know, we've been victimized. And the community really likes that type of thinking. It's one of the things that I really hate and I think is misogynistic about the community, because meeting girls is not an adversarial thing. Like Both of you win. <laughs> like, this is, you have to come into this with a win-win mentality. The reason I screen students is because I in addition, in, order, in, in addition to being an avid feminist, which is one of the more homosexual things that I say on a regular basis, um, I think that this is a win-win situation. You all are cool guys. Like, nobody who comes in here is stupid, right? Like, you, you have to be pretty smart to go on Google and find how to meet girls on the internet, you know? Retards don't generally sit there and go, hmm, I wonder if there's a 13-step algorithm that tells me how to go from meeting girls to having sex with them. It just doesn't happen. So, and most of us have been battered around a little bit, but 
you can lose sight of the idea that this is a win-win situation, that you're not doing anything to trick girls, that you're improving yourself, and as you improve yourself, the girls that you get will improve. So, I don't even know how I got on that rant. Um, but anyway, back to qualification. So a lot of guys, the pussy asshole spectrum, that's where I was. So a lot of guys, when they come into this, they want to swing the completely opposite degree, right? Because they see guys who are kind of jerks with girls. And they don't see past like, the bad behavior to what the underlying mechanisms are. The fact that the jerks respect themselves, that they put themselves first, they have high self-esteem, they think they deserve women, et cetera, et cetera. And so we swing really far the opposite way. And you'll see a lot of stuff like, don't compliment women. Or my favorite, my personal favorite, is the word supplication. When I first got online, this was like a big thing. It was like, you'd see guys online writing these hyperbolic sentences where they'd be like, I'd rather die than supplicate to a girl. And I always just thought, that guy's probably not getting laid. <laughs> like, sometimes, you know, you gotta do things to make girls happy. So, you swing all the way to the other side and you're like, I don't buy girls drinks ever, and I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I will not pick you up, you'll come meet me at my house. And then you realize that that doesn't work either. And so slowly you kind of swing back into the middle where ultimately you want to be is in a place where you respect yourself enough to set boundaries and not let people take advantage of you, but you're not a douchebag to everyone. And you can all ask me stories about my experience of that whole thing on the break. So qualification is complimenting, right? You do need to compliment girls. You need to give them legitimate reasons why you guys should see each other again because of similar interests or things in her that you admire and why you admire that. We'll talk extensively about that because that's my big contribution to the community. Um, happened in that area. Now, what happens if the girl won't qualify herself, right? You're trying to go forward, and you say something like, who are you, and you're special because, right? Which is one of my favorite qualifying lines. And she goes, I don't know, who are, why are you special, right? Cool, you now go back into attraction, right? You now tease, and then you go over here into attraction. We wanna, we wanna stay out of attraction, though. Why? Because it takes too much time and it's not relevant to what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to move into comfort and then we're trying to set up a date. Now along the way, and I have horrible handwriting, I know. Along the way, we have another little thing called an instant date. This was another thing I learned really early on. Right? Anyone in here ever play Sonic the Hedgehog, the video game? Come on, it's a PUA conference. Everyone in here played fucking Sonic. <laughs> All right. So you know how Sonic would dive underwater? He'd like have those little air bubbles and you'd get like a 10 second countdown? Yes. Okay, just say yes. That's all you gotta do. Um, that's kind of what it's like when you're talking to a girl during the day because especially if you stop a moving set, right? A girl who's walking somewhere. At some point, she's gonna look around, realize that she's talking to some random guy on the street and that she has something else to do. So you're in that little air bubble. And in that air bubble, it's really important that you try to get an instant date. Now, what is an instant date? It's simply going to another location. Why? Because it does two things. First, movement is the ultimate test of attraction. It's the ultimate test. If a girl is not attracted to you, she will not move with you somewhere, unless you use a knife. <laughs> Um, so you want to be careful, like, you want to be certain about that. So you go, and that, that applies to night game or day game. That's just a general rule when talking to girls. If you're like, hey, let's go over here and she comes, she's into you. Cool? So the other thing it does is it uses multiple venues, right? Multiple venues have a time distortion effect. The more places you hang out with someone, the longer it'll feel like you've known them, right? That's why on dates, we always want to go to two or three different places because every time there's a different snapshot memory and it feels like you've known that person a lot longer. If you have to hang out with someone for two or three hours, um, if you hang out in one place, like your house in the living room, it's gonna feel like two to three hours. If you hang out in four or five places for you know, 20 to 15 minutes at a time, it's gonna feel like a lot longer. And the third thing it does is it creates an us together dynamic as opposed to a we just met dynamic, right? When you're standing on the street or you're talking in a coffee shop across a table, she knows that you just met her and that this is somewhat of a pickup. There's the whole little, it's somewhat of a pickup alarm during the day as well. So by going, hey, I really want to grab a soda across the street, or I'm going to grab a burrito. Um, we'll talk about all of that stuff when we get to instant dates, because I had a whole system on how you can set up your own little triangle of instant dates, um, and we'll talk about that soon too. So instant date, and then eventually get the phone number, set up a date. So pretty simple, nothing really revolutionary, but it's a step-by-step -step process of how it actually goes down in real life.